Anyone else? <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to like you know. Right, we're gonna. Do, do you want to go out for the kids now? We pray for you guys. I must put that in this in my order so I don't forget. I say kids, kid, <laughs> child singular, child. Father, we thank you for thank you for Evan. Thank you for um, uh, Mena and Beverly. Bless you for them. May they have a fun time and in, and learn lots about you in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll call you back before the first, the last hymn, because there's actions to that one. Right, we're going now. We're going to read from the Bible. <laughs> Maureen's going to come and lead us. Our reading this morning is from Acts chapter 1 and verses 12 to 26. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through the mouth of David concerning Judas, who served as guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in this ministry. With the re reward he got for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong. His body burst open and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem ha heard about this, so they called that field in their language Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, May his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it. And make another, t t sorry, make another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. Beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they proposed two men, Joseph called Barsabas, also known as Justus, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apost apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, so he was added to the eleven apostles. This is the word of the Lord. You can leave it there if you want. Yeah, yeah just leave it in there. Yeah, tough. Excellent. Waiting for that to go off. It booms. So, the big day arrives. The conductor nervously watches the audience as they take their seats from behind this, the, the stage curtain. There's a buzz in the auditorium. They're wondering what's going to happen for this concert. It's time for the orchestra to file in and take their seats. And as they do so, the oboe sounds the A, and everyone tunes to it, as a good orchestra should. After wiping the profuse sweat from his brow, the conductor raises the baton for the upbeat. And as his hand goes down, nothing happens. 
What's going on here? What is happening? This orchestra is not prepared. They are completely unprepared. Uh, they just cannot play a note. Uh, if they are going to fulfill the potential of the music, they need to be prepared. They need hours of practice on their own and together as an orchestra. They need to pour over the music, learn their fingering, the dynamics and the phrasing and all the rest of it that comes with it. And they need hours of rehearsal together and that's how things come together. If you don't do that, you don't get anything. You get what you had there. Nothing happens. For an orchestra or a choir or a group of musicians to fulfill the potential of the music, to make it happen, They've got to be prepared, and their preparation needs to be characterized by three things. They need to be united. It's no good, let's say in a band, for example, it's no good the leader of the band playing in one key and, and uh, let's say, the bassist or the guitarist saying, oh, no, we're going to play in a completely different key. They've got to be together. They've got to be united. They've got to have the same music. So that's the first thing. Uh, the, the, the second thing is they've got to be purposeful. There's got to be a reason for their being together. Now, as, as when I was doing community choir, if we didn't do a concert, there was absolutely no point in, in being together. And you can't call yourselves a choir unless you've performed. So there's got to be a purpose, usually performance. And then... When, you, when you're in the throngs of it, you've got to persevere. That's the third thing that characterizes their preparation. You've got to persevere. You've got to get through it, no matter how difficult it might be. You've got to keep going. Now, why am I talking about all this? What does all this have to do with anything that we literally just read? Well, the reason I'm saying this is because this is the way the church should be. The church should be like this, unified or uni united, purposeful, and persevering. And, and it should be like this in prayer. In prayer. That is what we're talking about today. If we look at our passage uh, today, we see that the disciples were waiting for the promise of God to come to them. They were waiting for the promise of the Father. They were waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. And um, what, what do they do in the meantime? They pray. As they waited, they prayed. So the, I'm, I'm really only talking about one verse today. This was, a, this was a shock to me. But verse 14 is the verse that you want to remember. It says, all these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer. With certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. They were constantly devoting themselves to prayer. They, needed, they also needed to make a decision. And what did they do to make the decision? They prayed. Everything happens because of prayer. It was central to everything that the, the first church did and said. And so, as a church here, us, West End, we've been given a promise, haven't we? We've been given the promise that God wants to flood the town with His presence. That's the promise. And to do that, we want to be a church without barriers. That the promise of God is the vision is to fulfill, to, to, the vision to be fulfilled is to see the town flooded with the presence of God. And the way to do it is to be a church without barriers. Now, do we see that happening? Not really. Not yet. It's not happened quite yet. We're still waiting for the promise. But what do we need to do to see that happen? We need to be praying. And I'm not talking about just every now and again when we think about it. It needs to be unity. In unity, it needs to be purposeful prayer that perseveres, that keeps going, that doesn't stop. And so I want to look at these three things and help us to encourage us to pray more together. Um, and and, and, and the, I've called this thing the priority of prayer because prayer should be the first thing. We t How many of you, when somebody was ill and you say, well... All we can do now is pray. We're laughing because that's what we say. But that's wrong. It's wrong on all the levels of, of theology and all the rest of it. It's not right. Prayer isn't the last thing we do. Prayer's not a last resort. Prayer's the first resort. Where do you go? To the one who's bigger. Not to the, not to the doctors. How many of you know? Doctors don't know all that much. They really don't. We can't rely on doctors. 
We go to Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is the great physician. Jesus is the one who heals. That's where we go. And the only thing we do is we pray. That's what we can do. If we can't physically heal somebody, we can pray for somebody to be healed because Jesus does it. And he doesn't want people to be ill. Now, that opens up a whole can of worms about why come we prayed for some people and they died. And I know, and if you need to have a conversation with me about that, book, book me on Wednesday or something, um, you know, once I've gotten over Sunday. We can talk about that a whole other time. But the point is, prayer is the priority. If we want to see the promise of God, we've got to pray it into being. So the first thing that the believers were, they were united in prayer. They were united in prayer. It says in verse 14 in my translation, they devoted, that they were devoting themselves. Where is it? I can't find it. All of these were constantly devoting themselves. That word, themselves, it seems so innocuous in the English, doesn't it? It seems so insignificant. But that word in the Greek is way more loaded than just themselves. That word means in unity. In some translations, it says they were constantly devoting themselves in one accord. They were together. They were unified. They were in unity. They had mutual consent and agreed with one another. They prayed together in unity. They agreed. And as a result, they grew in their faith. This is something that you see pretty much throughout the book of Acts. Something needs to happen. They pray. They grow. And that's what happens because they prayed. So, there was an Old Testament reference that came to my mind as I was thinking about this in Amos chapter 3, verse 3. It says, do two walk together unless they've made an appointment or unless they've agreed to do so? No. That's what Amos is expecting you to answer, isn't it? He's expecting you to say, well, of course not. You don't go and do something without an appointment. It just doesn't, doesn't normally happen that way. And if something is going to be done well, it's got to be done in unity. How many of you know if you've been in a situation where you've got a group of people, you're trying to get something done, and you've got people in the group like this, at loggerheads with one another, button heads all the time. Nothing gets done, does it? Why? Because this one's complaining about this one doing that. It's a nightmare. I've been there. It's horrible. As a church, we can't be those people. If we have disagreements, we need to keep short accounts with one another, apologize, forgive, and move on, because nothing that that person has done to you is as bad as you think it is. Trust me, it really isn't. There there are a lot worse things that happen in life. So we need to be in agreement and in unity. And I'm not saying that we're at loggerheads. I really don't think we are. I think there's a great spirit around the church at the moment. We're not at loggerheads. But just for the future, should something happen, we've got to be unified. Going back to the analogy with the orchestra. They're they're together to play together. They've got to be together to rehearse because you can't, I mean, you can can do it individual practice on your own, but like in lockdown, do you remember that they had all these things where choirs were, people would sing um, on their own part um, into into a video and then somebody would have to stitch it all together with the, the accompaniment, all the rest of it. It was useless. It was horrible because that's not how you make music together. You've got to be in the same room. You've got to be next to each other. When I get together with my choir and we sing together, it's brilliant because we're all together. We had a great moment at the end of the rehearsal last week. It was brilliant. By the way, do come on the 3rd of June. It's going to be excellent. It's going to be really good. We've we've paid for a string string quartet to come and all the rest of it. It'd be great. Children under 18, come free. So if you, like, make yourself look younger, you could get in free. No. No, we need the money. Pay, pay the money. Anyway, you've got, like a choir, like an orchestra, you've got to be together of one mind. Because if you're not, and, and, and when I say of one mind, an orchestra will have a score that they are working from. A choir will have, have music that they're singing from usually. And it's the same one. If you have different editions, it creates real havoc, actually. So you've all got to have the same music. And that's the way the church should be in prayer. Together. We need to be praying together. I know before I came, um, which is nearly 11 years ago now, but before I came, I know there was a regular prayer meeting, and I know that prayer meeting was generally well attended. And, And what was great about it was that you were all unified around one cause, to to see in the next minister, which happened to be me in the end. But I know that that you as a church can pray and have done it before. And so we need to be, we, that just because I'm here, I'm not going to pray for you. My prayers will not change you. They won't. They'll change me. 
they'll make me better because I'm, you know, it's, it's my communication with the Lord. But it's not going to change you, is it? How can my prayers change you? They're not going to change you. Praying changes us. But if we're not praying together and if we're not praying on our own, how is that going to make a difference? We've got to be praying together. We won't see it happen. So today, what's our unifying cause? Our unifying cause is to see the town flooded with the presence of God, to see the kingdom come on earth as in heaven. That's what we do. But we're never going to see that happen unless we're praying together. That's the important thing. So we've got to be praying in unity, unity in prayer. And then the second thing that the disciples were here, they were purposeful in prayer. They were purposeful in prayer. They prayed on purpose for a purpose. They wanted to receive the promise of the Father, which was the Holy Spirit who was to come, and they needed to make a decision. And that was the other reason they were praying. Excuse me a moment. I wonder if you can answer for me this question in your head. How often do your prayers, do my prayers, become aimless? You know, you're praying and you just think, I don't know what to pray about. Anybody in that boat boat every now and again? You think, what am I supposed to pray about? Do you know, when my prayers become aimless, um, are you like me? Do you lose the will to pray? You just think, I can't be bothered with this. What's the point in praying? It happens to us because it's really easy to pray if we know somebody who's sick. Lord, make them better. We, it's really easy to pray if we know somebody who's in need of some kind. And okay, we might not be presently available to pray for them, but to, to, to actually meet that need, but we can pray for them. Easy to pray when there's a purpose or a specific need. Really hard to pray if we don't seem to have a purpose to our praying. And we just feel like, what is the point? There is no point in praying. Friends, there is always a prayer to be prayed. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That's the prayer. That's the purpose. And for us specifically, let's see the town flooded with the presence of God. That's the purpose. for. Pr- that's what we're praying into. So when our prayers become aimless, if you don't have anything else to pray, pray, Lord, come and flood the town with your presence. And what does that mean? That means, firstly, for us, Lord, come and fill me with your presence. Come and make a difference in my life so that the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead will come into my heart and out of my heart will flow rivers of living water that Jesus talked about from John 7, which I read this week. Go and read John 7. Jesus wants to give you rivers of living water that don't just flow just into and, 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 and kind of make a pool in your heart. They flow out of you. And so, how, how do we flood the presence of, how does the presence of God come into the town? You and me. That's how it works. So, we've got to pray firstly, Lord, let your presence come and flood my soul. Come, come, and, come and fill me afresh. But then, the second thing we pray, when we pray, come and flood the town, we're praying, come and flood the church. Come and let the church be filled with the presence of God. So much so that when people come into this room, they hit the deck because the kingdom of God is so present. The presence of God is so available here. I remember going to Church of Christ the King in um, Brighton. Uh, it's an NFI church. They don't, I don't agree with them completely theologically, but man, do they know how to cultivate the presence of God in a place. We went there. This was 20 years ago. We were late. We, we were late by about 15 or 20 minutes, maybe half an hour, and they'd already started worshipping for that, for that length of time. And as we were ascending, because they're their bits up, their worship centers upstairs. So you have to go upstairs. As we were going up the stairs, I could feel the tangible presence of God. Because that church knows how to have the presence of God. Let that be our prayer that people can feel the tangible presence of God when they come in. Not just on a Sunday morning, but on a, on a Thursday afternoon when the toddler group comes in. On a Wednesday morning when people come for Renew. On a Saturday morning for, for Renew. On any other time when any other people are gathering in this place, may they feel the presence of God. Pray for that. And it also means that when we're praying for the, the place to be flooded with His presence, we're praying for the town. 
So we're praying for the various needs of our town. We're praying, Holy Spirit, come and flood the various places, all these housing estates. Rather than complaining about them, and I'm, I'm preaching this to myself, rather than complaining about them, what we should be doing is saying, Lord, what are we going to do with all those people moving into all these houses in this town? How are we going to bring the presence of God to those places? That's what we should be praying. That's what we should be asking the Lord to do. And then we should be thinking, what are we going to do about it? And then we're praying for the world. So if you don't have prayer resources from Open Doors, Tear Fund, or BMS, go on their website and sign up to them and get the booklets and pray every day. Every day I pray for, oh, for, the, for the Persecuted Church with the Open Doors um, prayer guide. I pray for Tear Fund and the various different projects that they're doing across the world, you know, in all, or everywhere. They're, they're in Africa, Asia, South America, the whole place. Um, and BMS as well. Get the prayer guides. Sign up for them. Pray for them every day. Lord, let your presence flood those places. That's what we're praying for. That's the purpose. That's what happens when we pray for the town to be flooded. That's the purpose. That's why we're praying. We've got to pray on purpose. When we do, we'll begin to see things change. If we don't, we're not going to see anything. And the third, the final thing, persevere in prayer. The disciples, they had to wait for the promise, but they persevered. They kept praying. They didn't know how long it was going to be, but they waited and they persevered in prayer. They kept on going, no matter what it looked like. It says, um, uh, Luke writes, they constantly devoting, devoting, and that word devoting, it actually has the connotation in it of praying Per, with perseverance, keep, of keeping going, constant prayer. And, and they carried on praying even after the Spirit came. We read in, in, at the end of Acts chapter 2, they still devoted themselves. That's the same meaning. I've, I've, I think I've mentioned this before, but my first ever concert with Athenaeum Singers in Warminster, we did uh, my first major concert. I did a carol concert before, but this was in April 2022. So about a year ago, just over a year ago. We were doing this thing by Vaughan Williams called Dona Nobis Pacem, which was a kind of a propaganda against war piece that he wrote, I think, around 1936, so between the two world wars. And this piece was really hard. I mean, it was hard. It was hard to sing, and I don't know how the, I don't know how the tiny little orchestra we had, <laughs> I don't know how they did it, but they did it. And um, it was hard, and we didn't get it. We, we just didn't get it. And most people said, I hate it absolutely hate it. Can't, couldn't stand it. Uh, but, but we persevered with it. We persevered because we knew that our conductor, Tim, knew what he was doing, so we trusted him. We persevered. We kept going with it. Got to the concert, got to the concert day. Practiced with the orchestra. It penny drops. Everybody gets it. Oh, I get it now. Wow. They didn't get it before, but we persevered with it, and we had an amazing concert. It was, it was amazing. It was by far one of the best things I've ever done. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Keeps me going back for more. C can't get enough of it. We persevered. We've got to persevere. And the same is true for us in our discipleship as believers. We've got to persevere. If we don't persevere, we'll never see anything happen. We've got to keep going and never stop. Why? Um, unfortunate to the human condition is this. Nobody really likes change. Even the people that say they like change, they don't really like change that much. We don't like to change. So it takes a while for us, most of us. Some people are a bit quicker on the mark than others, and that's great. Um, those are the people that get saved instantly. They hear the gospel straight away, and they're like, oh, I want to be with Jesus forever. Those people are an exception to the rule. Talk to Mike Smith when he comes back, and he'll tell you that he is one of those people. He just instantaneously. I'm, I wasn't. I, I grew up in the church, and it took a long time before I decided I really wanted to be right with the Lord. I was seven years old, and that was then, and then I still wasn't right until I was about 11. So really, it took 11 years for me to properly dedicate my life to Jesus. 11 years. Why? I don't like change. Hate change. Can't bear it. Does my head in. That's why we need to be persistent in prayer, because we don't like change. It takes a long time for our, our brains to catch up with what God wants to do, and so we need to be persistent in prayer, because if we're not asking, it's not going to happen, and if we're not doing anything about it, it's never going to happen. So we've got to keep on keeping on until we see things start 
to shift. So we've got to persevere in prayer. So we'll be, we, so look, verse 14, all these, so all the people he mentioned and then everybody else, were constantly devoting themselves to prayer. They were constantly devoting themselves to prayer. They persevered with one purpose and one mind. And that's how we see the early church waiting for the promise of God. And that's where we need to be now. If we want to see the promise of God, we've got to, be, we've got to take a leaf from their book. And we've got to pray in unity. Pray with each other. We've got to pray with purpose to see it happen. And we've got to pray all the time, not ceasing, becoming desperate for more of God in every area of our lives. So, that's the end of the script. What I want to do as a response, we'll spend about a minute and just ask the Lord, what is the one thing that I need to hear from this today? And then I'm going to get, and then what, what, once, you've, once we've had the minute, I'm going to ask you to get up, and I know you don't want to do this because nobody likes change, because we're all in our same seats. You're going to get up and find some other people, not the people you're sitting next to, find some other people, groups of three or four, and pray with them into this. If you want to share the thing that God's given you this morning, share that. Get them to pray for you. Lay hands on each other if you feel that's appropriate. Always ask beforehand. Everybody's the ministry team here this morning. Pray. pray. If you're not desperate for God, pray to be desperate for God. If you're, not, if, you, if you're not sure about the Holy Spirit, pray. Holy Spirit, convince me. I need it. Ask the Lord. If you're fed up, if you're tired, if you think I'm just praying, for, if you think this is just a gimmick, then pray into that and say, Lord, convince me otherwise if it's not. Ask Jesus, ask the Holy Spirit to come and refresh your mind and your heart in whatever way that is. Pray, above all though, pray for the Holy Spirit to come and flood your life that you might have rivers of living water, okay? So take a moment, take a minute just to pray, Lord, what's the one thing? And then when I start to play, you can get up and move around. I, I will, I'll, I'll prompt you at that point as well. Come Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you. We bless you for the example of the early church and how they devoted themselves constantly to prayer. Thank you, Lord. And so, Holy Spirit, come now and for us, this one thing that you're telling to us, whatever it is that we need to do, come, Holy Spirit, come afresh. May we know your heart. May we hear you speaking and respond. Take a minute. Thank you, Lord. If you if you don't want to be prayed with that's fine